Hello, friends. I am so delighted to be joined today with Sarah McKenzie. Sarah is best known as the author of Teaching from Rest, a homeschooler's guide to unshakable peace and the read aloud family. Make meaningful and lasting connections with your kids. She's the host of the Read Aloud Revival podcast. I know many of you already are listening to that one. And she's also the publisher of a brand new boutique publishing house, Wax Wing Books, and is the author of their first picture book, A Little More Beautiful, The Story of a Garden, which is illustrated by Breezy Brookshire. So I'm so glad that you're here, Sarah. Could you start just by telling us a little bit about yourself and your family and how you guys got started on this homeschooling adventure? Yeah, I'd love to. And thank you for having me, Amy. It's just a it's a complete delight to be here chatting with you. So, and I I love your chair. I don't know how often you hear that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> it's a really uh, fabulous you know, chair. Recycle. <laughs> <laughs> even better, even better. Um, okay. So my husband, Andrew and I have been married for 21 years and we live in the Pacific Northwest. We have six kids. Our oldest is 20 years old. She just finished her sophomore year at university. And then we have another one. We just graduated this year. Who's heading off to her freshman year in college. We have a high schooler. We have a 10 year old we have twins who are going to be nine very soon. So, um, a whole slew of children. We have homeschooled all the way through, but if you had told my husband this, <laughs> Back at the beginning, he would have said, no, we are not. Uh, when we first started homeschooling, uh, my old, our oldest was just a few years old. And I had seen some old blog posts or forum chats. I mean, this was a long time ago. So I'm trying to remember exactly the first hint I got at homeschooling, but it was something online. And I started like checking books out at the library. And I loved this idea of home education. I also, as she got older and became closer to kindergarten age, was like, I don't really want to send her away all day. She's become really fun to be around. And I love spending time with her. And so I um, didn't know anyone who homeschooled in my real actual life. And my husband knew one homeschooling family growing up. Uh, they were super weird. So he was like, no, we are not homeschooling. That's not going to be a thing. Um, but we ended up uh, actually kind of arguing about it quite a bit. So Back then, let's see, we had a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and one-year-old at the time. Audrey is about it's time to send her to kindergarten. And I realized there is no way God is calling us to two, like two different ways. You know, he's not calling me to homeschool and my husband. To, so I thought we've got to stop arguing about this. I have to stop arguing about this. So I'm just going to pray like crazy that, you know, God would leave my husband and we will, and I'll just follow his lead here and we'll just go. So we did, we researched all these local kindergartens and because at the time we were living in a school district that um, was not great. And you could actually pick any school you wanted your kids to go to in the whole district at the beginning of their kindergarten year. Um, so I, re I visited several, I picked one, I cried quietly, was very good about keeping all this to myself at that point and not trying to start arguments. And then my husband came home from work one day out of the blue and he does not remember now, like what was the thing that instigated this, but he came home one day and said, okay, you can have one year. And I thought, I'll take it. I'll take one year. <laughs> and so we did. And then, you know, about halfway through kindergarten, he said, okay, you can, you can have a couple more. She seems to be doing great. And, you know, I think as soon as it's one of those things where when something is unfamiliar territory, it feels we're, we're fearful. We're not sure we're skeptical. So as soon as, you know, we met other homeschooling families and we started like both of us really realizing the richness of a home education life. We didn't want to give it up. So, and now you're a second generation homeschooler, right? I am. Yes. I was homeschooled all the way through high school graduation and my husband was homeschooled through seventh grade. So it's really fun to be able to take the best things that we remember from our own home education and then put our own unique family spin on it. And my yeah. oldest is now a rising senior. So I really enjoyed oh, the, yes. the yes. recent episode you did with your daughter. That was really fun. Oh, it was really fun to hear her perspective. Um, that's something that I think I really craved early on was the perspective of homeschooler, homeschooling moms who had finished or had like, you know, gotten further um, than me and could look back and say, Hey, focus on this and stop worrying so much about this other thing. So hearing from my daughter, what her, you know, what helped her most her first couple of years in college and what does she remember? What does she cherish most from those years was helpful. Did you, so since you were, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be, I'm not the interviewer, but I'm going to ask some questions because I'm curious. <laughs> Did you always know you at homeschool? Like, was that always something in your mind? 
Yes, I had a really positive experience with homeschooling and felt like it provided a wonderful education experience. I loved the relationship I developed with my brother, uh, who was four years, but five grades younger than I was. Okay. And so we were able to be really close growing up, uh, even through moves and things like that. I don't think we would have had that same experience um, if we had been in a traditional school. So I had a great homeschool experience and my husband and I talked about it even before we were married. So yeah, it was just sort of a no brainer. It wasn't a big yeah. decision for us. It was just what we decided to do. Yeah. 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 I love it. And I think that it's really encouraging to hear people, for people to hear your story because so many new homeschoolers are coming into this and they're so scared because it seems overwhelming. Maybe even the thought, you know, the, the preschool mom who's like, but what about the high school transcript, you know, and they yeah. already have globalized that like the worst case scenario or what's going to happen in 10 years. And it can be a scary thing to step out in faith, especially if you don't know anyone in your real life who's doing this crazy thing, or you haven't seen the successful like results of it in your real life. And so I think it's good to hear, like you started off not knowing a lot of people homeschooling, not yeah, having yeah. it all figured out. It was just this thing you were going to try for a year. So how has your approach to homeschooling, home education grown and changed over those ensuing years? However many, a couple decades now? No, less than two decades. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so a couple of things come to mind. First of all, that idea of what you just said about globalizing, you know, like, oh my gosh, how many, you have a preschooler and we, we do tend to do this. I tend to do this at least where I will be looking at my eight-year-old and realizing I forgot to teach him how to tie his shoes, you know? <laughs> I mean, I've always gotten Velcro and oh my goodness, I've never taught him how to tie his shoes. And now I'm making it all about like all the things that I have forgotten to teach him as if I'm launching him out into the world like tomorrow, which is not what happens. We have all this time, but we do tend to do that. Um, I think one of the things that has shifted from my early days of homeschooling to now is um, having a little more perspective on like what matters and what doesn't, you know what I mean? And like those moments where you realize like you forgot to teach your kid what, um, how to tie their shoes or like they say something about geography and you think, oh my goodness, you think, you know, France is one of the United States of America. I think we should probably fix this. Um, where you, where you kind of realize those gaps and things happen no matter where your kids are educated. We tend to wear that burden on our shoulders because we're doing all the parenting and home educating and so the pressure is there, but I think also realizing um, that my oldest two who graduated, they, especially my oldest daughter, since she's 20, and we just had this conversation on the Read Aloud Revival podcast about what was helpful to her. Um, there are plenty of things I forgot, like just downright either forgot or could not get to teaching her because we were so busy with our hands full of babies, which we can talk about too, um, that she just could fill in those gaps herself. Like if they have the tools for learning and sort of like you're talking about this rich, like you have these rich, warm relationships or memories of your own homeschool, a really warm, fun memories and sibling relationships with your brother. Um, those kinds of things carry our kids so much further. And listening to my oldest daughter talk about how the things that she really thinks she gained from homeschooling, so much of what she said was about relationships. And that really echoes what all these experienced homeschooling moms have been telling me for years, which is it's all about relationships. And and you're not going to wish you had spent more time doing math. I mean, you should do math, but like no homeschooling mom is like, I wish we'd spent six more hours a week doing math. You know, they tend to remember relationships and say like, I wish I'd enjoyed it more. I wish we had spent more time talking or reading together, you know, the warm relationship kind of things. The other thing that comes to mind for me right away um, about what I would do different or how my homeschool has evolved, I guess, over the years is that early on, I had a very deep longing to belong to a certain kind of homeschool group. So I wanted to be either classical or Charlotte Mason or unschooly or something. I wanted my people. I wanted to know who I was and like where I fit in, which is very human, right? That we all want to belong. But I think in an effort to learn all I could about um, those homeschooling philosophies and methods, I sort of got wrapped up in this ideal version of what an ideal education could look like instead of looking at the children God gave me right in front of me and being like, these are the children. These are the images of God that I am charged with bringing up. How can we do that? And there's great things in classical and Charlotte Mason and unschooling that can, you know, lend help there. But I sort of got like my eyes off the prize sort of, and instead of focusing on my kids, I was, I was idealizing. And we do this now, I think differently than we did, you know, 15 
10 years ago, because now we do it on by looking at Instagram or whatever, idealizing this perfect homeschool. Where do I want my dream homeschool to be? But really your dream homeschool is right in front of you with the kids God gave you. So that's, that's something that I feel like it's sort of grown me just being more comfortable with being not really any particular kind of homeschooler. Um, Pam Barnhill likes to say, uh, she's a homeschool mom of three. She's got several podcasts. She likes to say that they're us schoolers instead of, you know, unschoolers or Charlotte Mason homeschoolers or something. I love that. I think that's, that feels really accurate to me. We're all just us schoolers. <laughs> and I think as a second generational homeschooler, that is something that I really bring with me. I don't, my homeschool doesn't look just the way my mom's homeschool looked. It doesn't look the way my mother-in-law's homeschool looked. But yeah. what I've carried is I've never been inside the box. I've never been in the system. And so to be the rebel unique, like I'm just going to do what works best for my family comes very natural. That actually feels normal to me. So being within the homeschool world now, which seems so different from when I was growing up, where people have yes. very strict labels and boxes. And if you do not fit their little labels and boxes just quite right, you're not in their group. And that to me is sort of like, I thought the whole point of homeschooling was figuring out what was going to work best for our unique families, taking the principles, the ideas, but yeah. then having the freedom to work those out in a unique, fun way that's like just for your family, right? Yeah, well, and then one of the benefits, I guess, we have in our generation now of the, those of us who are homeschooling in the trenches now is we have all of these examples of homeschoolers who did homeschooling in a wide variety of ways and it worked on all accounts. So, you know, it works for families who were very classical and it worked for families who were unschooly and it worked for families who did all different kinds, you know, used textbooks and then who didn't use textbooks. Like there's the homeschooling works because of the relationships and because it's based on love between a parent and a child, which is the strongest kind of human love that there is, you know? So I just feel like, um, we get that benefit now that, uh, like your parents probably didn't have were like the example that this works. They had to take it on faith going like, I really hope this works, which we all feel a little bit. I will say when I put together my oldest daughter's transcripts and we sent them off to the universities she was applying to, I was like, Whew, I really hope this works. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> yes. I mean, even like I've seen it work for myself, but even now as my yes. approaching that senior year with my son, I'm like, I really hope this turns out okay. <laughs> And then no, I have to so remind true. myself, this is not my identity. This is not where my hope lies. You know, it's outside of me. Um, right. I'll mention here, I'll put this in the show notes, but I actually did a series um, on the Curriculum Choice website, the Homeschool Generation series. And I told my own story, but I also interviewed half a dozen first, kind of that first initial generation of homeschool oh, moms. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then another part of it was I interviewed several other second generation homeschool moms, more uh, sort of within my, my generation of having grown up. And uh, it was really interesting to see the perspectives from both sets of moms. So I'll put that link in the show notes. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll check that out because I'm really, that's so interesting. And I think there's so much that we can learn from those who've gone before. And also, like you said, the homeschooling landscape looks very different now than it did 15 years ago. So again, when we're talking, when we're thinking about, you know, when I'm talking to Sally Clarkson or some someone who homeschooled in a different climate really than we are, um, you can get so much wisdom and you can also go, okay, how does this apply to my own kids and my own, and in our time and in with the different kind of social pressures that we have on us now that we, that maybe she didn't, you know? So yeah, it's like that constant learning and growing. So yeah, I'm excited exactly. to check out that series. Yeah. Well, we've talked about some of these positive aspects of homeschooling, but it's not all sunshine and roses all the time. So have there been any challenges that you have faced over the years homeschooling and how have you sought to overcome those challenges? Yes. I mean, which ones to pick? That's really, there's like a litany of them, right? I think we can, we can all, it, if, you know, if we were all to ask ourselves, you know, what's not working in your homeschool right now? A lot of us could immediately think of five things. If we went, what's working really well? Sometimes it takes us a minute. We're like, just a second. I'm sure I can come up with something. <laughs> um, the biggest thing for me at the early days was pressure, social pressure from family and friends who also didn't know any homeschoolers and thought we were for sure ruining our kids. And every homeschooler also has that little teensy worry that like, is this really the best thing that we should be doing? And am I actually ruining my children? Um, at one point in our homeschool, we had 12 year old, 10 year old, an eight year old, a one year old and twin newborns. <laughs> so Those nothing years, to do at all. It was no, easy. not at all. <laughs> not at all. It was really challenging. I, 
I really worried that, especially with the 12 year old who's about sixth grade ish, those aren't years that you just feel like you can just shrug school off for a while. Although we really didn't do a whole lot because we couldn't, because I was drowning in babies. Um, those years were the pressure that I felt from outside to like put the kids in school. You're not, you can't possibly do this. You're not superhuman. And then also for myself about what I would be able to do and what I was expecting myself to do. That pressure I think has been um, one of the biggest challenges. And I really feel like as much pressure as some of us who have like unsupportive family members or whatever, is, is still the pressure from inside is harder. Like the pressure we put on ourselves to get it right. And that kind of of tied to that, this um, idea of like a measuring stick, I think for a lot of us, and I don't know, um, Amy, you'll have to tell me if this is true for you being homeschooled. I have this internal measuring stick that is based on my own education in the public school system that I pull out and I don't even know I have it out, you know, and I'm like measuring what my kids know and what they're able to do based on what I knew and what I was able to do at different grades or ages or what the kids in my cul-de-sac who go to the local public school are able to do. I'm constantly using the wrong measuring stick. Like I didn't put them in school on purpose. And yet <laughs> I continue to use the measuring stick that the public schools chose <laughs> to measure their students. And so that has been a challenge. I think realizing that this, this way that a uh, school measures success has zero bearing on the way that we can measure what we're doing in our own homeschool. Have you, is that something that you struggle with as well? Or is that different for you? I think it's a little different, but the same root fear, the same root anxiety, because I don't even really know what it, you know, what a public school education would look like. You know, I'm like, ah, I don't care about that. But when I see the other family that's, you know, chosen to homeschool in a different way, yeah. and oh, I see the amazing things they're doing with their kids. I'm not doing with my kids. And I think to myself, but I, I'm doing it this way on purpose. Yeah. Like I chose this set of things yeah. and those are good things, but it's always that like comparison, right? Oh, but I'm not doing those things. And maybe if I only did those things, everything would go well. And if I don't do X, Y, Z, I'm ruining my children. So I think that comparison thing is always at the, at the root of that fear, as opposed to just kind of having the blinders on, I yeah. made this choice. And that doesn't mean we can't learn and grow or, um, or make changes. We have to have yeah. that flexibility too, but yeah, that measuring stick thing that you pull out like, yeah. Oh no, I can really relate yeah. to that. Well, and actually you, what you just said reminded me too, that idea of like trade-offs, like you have to kind of put your blinders on, like I chose this. One of the things that I've struggled with, um, and I think we all kind of do it on some level and maybe some personalities struggle with it more than others. I don't know, is that, um, wanting to do more, like wanting to do everything or getting bored easily. I have a tendency to get bored easily and want to start too many projects and to, to like switch things all up. So I've had to create some guardrails for myself. One is that I don't usually let myself switch curriculum, like in the middle of a six week, I'll, I'll give myself like a six to eight week term. And for that amount of time, I have to stick with whatever I planned, not like rigid, not as far as like the schedule goes, but as in, I'm not allowed to on a Tuesday morning at 10, go online and order a whole new math curriculum because my math curriculum <laughs> not working. And this is just, you know, know thyself, right? This is just me knowing that that feels like a solution to me when it's not a solution. So it kind of requires me to sit with the problem and go like, wait, maybe the solution is doing math at a different time of day or having shorter or with chocolate. Other... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, you know, knowing your own personality is really helpful. And if you're someone who thrives on change, but you know, like the best thing for your kid is to have that consistency. I like to find something that doesn't matter to change. And I know, so for instance, in my family, it's our memory work in the morning time. I know every month the poems, the scripture passages, the hymn is all going to change. Okay. So it's just that month. And that gives yes. me something to look forward to. Like I thrive on that novelty, but it's not anything that's um, going to throw off the whole homeschool project for the year. So. That's good. Yes. It's like a, it's like built in novelty basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other piece there, I think too, is that, um, so we all have to make trade-offs, you know, like we can't do hands-on history and a whole bunch of science experiments and lots of field trips and like a homestead and read aloud a ton and travel the world. Like there's, we just can't. So we all have to sort of pick what are your big things in your homeschool, you know, and I know for you, like memory work is a big piece of that. So for me, one of the things I've realized is when I because we all make these trade-offs and I'll go, okay, reading aloud is a huge piece for us in our homeschool. Um, and for years, I knew that I was making a trade-off like, yes, I'm going to choose reading aloud over other things because I know it's 
better. But what I didn't come to terms with is the fact that I was going to have to say no to other really good things. Like I'm not just choosing read aloud over everything that's not good. I'm choosing it over a lot of other really good things too. And that I think maybe gets exacerbated by social media because then we go on whatever social media choice that you use and you see a whole bunch of homeschoolers who have made a different trade-off and wonder if yours is the one that, you know, we just have to kind of remind ourselves that what, like what you said earlier, we chose this on purpose. We did this on purpose. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I know that, you know, Don Garrett and I, people are probably yes. tired of me bringing this up. On, I love her post where she did that composite homeschool mom, yes. uh, where she's like the little, it becomes like a monstrous compilation of this person's eye and this person's nose, but somehow we have in our head that we have to be the best parts of every homeschool mom we know, instead of remembering, we're all just doing some things and not doing others. And that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So this idea about finiteness and resting in that, like being okay with that, that not being a problem or something we have to change is a perfect segue to this next question, because I have been hearing actually from a lot of homeschool moms in totally different seasons, but they're all saying about the same thing. They're all worried that they're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. There are moms who have all of these little ones and they feel like all they can get to is just keeping people in diapers, you know, maybe not even like keeping the house clean, just literally keeping people fed and relatively, you know, nourished and loved is about all they can get to. And they're worried, you know, am I failing my older kids? Like we haven't gotten to all the lessons or the read alouds that I had planned. Or others are approaching high school and they're thinking, oh my goodness, now I have all this, you know, pressure of the high school years. And what if I don't do enough? Right. And I think that it can be easy to have these feelings of insufficiency, these doubts, right? That we're doing enough, that our homeschool is enough. Um, and it all comes down to like, there's just one person, right? There's just one us, there's 24 hours. Yeah. We can't yeah. multiply that. So how do we make the best choices? Like you were saying, there, there are so many good things yeah. and we can't even do all the good things. We're not choosing between like the good and the bad things. We're choosing between multiple good things. Yeah. So how do we decide how to prioritize what's best for our unique families? And then how do we deal with those doubts when they creep up? I think there's a couple things going on here. One is that <laughs> I don't think we talk about this enough in the homeschooling world, but I think most homeschooling moms that I know tend to be, and I'm right here with, them, I'm like not pointing fingers. I'm right here in it with them tend to be a little on the, like, like to retain control kind of side of things. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's why we're a partly why we're homeschooling, right? Because we're like, yeah, you know, we get to pick everything and be in charge. Yeah. Um, and that can kind of bleed over into this idea of deciding, you know, when we make a decision, because we all have to make decisions about what gets priority in our school day. We're also kind of making a decision about what we want our kids to remember about their school experience. And when I was just talking to my daughter, my 20 year old daughter about her memories of homeschooling, it just became very clear to me that regardless of, you know, I was doing things that I wanted her to remember, but whether or not she remembered those as like the pivotal experiences was not up to me. So my work was to create this environment and create this home education life that I thought would feed her soul. And then God's work is to let it actually feed and nurture her soul in whatever ways he sees fit. So one of the things that's been really helpful to me is that story in the Bible of Jesus feeding the 5,000 on the hillside. And so, you know, imagining this huge throng of 5,000 people and they're all hungry. Maybe the sun, you know, it's getting hot and the disciples are looking around going, all these people are going to need food and we have nothing to give them. So send them away, which is kind of how I feel every day when, when the school bus goes by my cul-de-sac, you know, like send them away. I don't have enough for these children, especially in those days when I had three babies and then the other kids, oh my goodness. It was like, that was the perpetual state was not enoughness. I don't have enough for these kids, which is true because I didn't, and I still don't. Um, the good news though, is that we weren't really, we're not really being asked to have enough. So if we were going to finish that sentence, like I'm afraid I'm not doing enough. And we just finished it like in math so that my kids will have all the math that they need to know. Or I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm doing enough to nurture my kids' faith so that they hold on to their faith when they're older. Or when we start drilling down, we might kind of see the absurdity of the question or the, the idea of being enough anyway, because nobody can make sure that their kids hold on to their faith through their whole life. That's not your job. You're, you know, you're not, not the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> Exactly. So we take on the work of the Holy Spirit and wonder why we feel like it's like an outsized job 
It's like, that is because it is. <laughs> you weren't called to that. So when we think back to that idea of, of feeding the 5,000, I always think it's so interesting. I mean, Jesus could have instantly fed every single person on that hillside. And, you know, in a blink of an eye, they could have all had a huge feast in front of them. And maybe that would have been more impressive than what he did, because what he did was said, well, bring me what you have. He looks at his disciples. He said, we don't have anything. We don't have enough. Send them away. And Jesus says, bring me what you have. So they have this little basket from a little boy of a couple loaves of bread and some fish, and he makes it enough. And that reminds us, I think, that that's what we're being called to do. Our job is not actually to feed the 5,000 or to make sure our kids have everything they possibly need and get a certain result or outcome. Our job is to bring our basket. It's to give them what we have, which every day is never going to feel like enough because it's not. It's sort of helpful for us then to remember that um, we're not actually being called to get a certain result or to be quote unquote su successful, like in the eyes of the world or even in the eyes of the greater homeschool community. We are being called to be faithful every day. And when we remember that, then we can go, okay, I'm not actually supposed to be enough. So this feeling of not enoughness is normal and it's good because it makes me rely on the Holy Spirit. Yes. I think that's so important because if we can actually, instead of thinking, well, I just, okay, I ought to do more, do more, be better. Instead, if we can say, yes, I am a creature, like I'm not the creator, right? This is yes. who I am. And so pointing us to Christ and the work he's already done, like if I, we can rest in that hope, then it takes away so much of the fear, worry, and anxiety of this, like got to do more, got to be a better homeschool mom, you know, can't let anybody down because yeah. that is a burden yeah. we are not designed to handle. No. And it, well, I mean, I think burnout is really common in homeschooling and it has this like cyclical kind of nature in the life of a homeschooling parent, I think, um, w over the course of like a year of school year. That's why we all want to quit like in October and in February. Right. But, but also over the long term, I mean, I remember when my oldest daughter went off to college, it was the first time I really realized I'm going to be in my homeschool longer than anyone else because I've been homeschooling her since the beginning and she's moved on and I'm still here very much in it. Um, so that, I don't remember where I was going with that exactly, but um, yeah, this, just this idea of like, what are we actually called to do? And then realizing that, like you said, we're finite creatures, we have limitations and that's not a downside. That's not um, a limitation, actually. The fact that we have limitations is exactly how we were designed. And so that's exactly the best way for us to home educate our kids and to raise them and to help them grow in their faith and grow in their um, academic skills and life skills. That's exactly how it's meant to work. Um, we tend to think of it as a limitation, but that's because we're letting the world, you know, whisper in our ear. Yeah. And God is faithful to to sustain the children in ways that we can't even. And I, I think about my own memories. I don't really remember like a specific math worksheet I did in the seventh grade or something like that. Yeah. But I remember the time my mom beat on the museum door after it had just closed. And she was like, but we're from out of town. Can't you let us in? And like, we got a personal tour. <laughs> did you really? That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> she was like, well, if you don't ask, the answers already know. So That's right. you know, those are the things that I remember um, that gave me a joy and a love for learning. And so sometimes I'll be like, kids, don't you remember this amazing thing I did with you? And they'll be like, no, I have absolutely no memory of that. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, hours, hours and time and energy and money, like I put into this and you, you don't remember it at all, but then they'll, they'll bring up some random thing. I'll be like, I don't even remember that, but that's yeah. what the Lord has used to, to stick in their heart and their mind. So yeah, that's so good. Well, as you think about you get to kind of do this homeschool thing again with a second set of kids. I was curious if there are any books in particular or poems, things that you were so excited to get to experience again with your younger children. Yeah, that's good. It's really fun actually to have another, another batch of children because <laughs> um, I can, I can kind of go like, oh yeah, this was real. This really was exciting. One of the things I love to do is revisit Shakespeare. So we just do, we'll usually read a Shakespeare play a year. So I'm not doing a whole bunch of them, just maybe one a year. And a lot of times we'll start by just reading adaptations of it, um, picture book versions or whatever of, of the play. And then we might listen to the real Shakespeare. We might just listen to snippets of it, might memorize some passages from it. That is always fun. I will say this year we did um, a Midsummer Night's Dream and I was doing it with my twin eights and my 10 and my 16 year old son 
happened to be in the kitchen, like making himself lunch and w- kind of wanders into the room and starts reciting the passages with us. And uh, he, he, the look on his face, like he didn't realize he had remembered it either, you know, that when he was like, oh, I still have that, um, was really fun and rich. And so that's really fun. Um, I love also when I'm reading to my younger kids and whether it's a novel or a picture book and like, I won't even realize till I look up that the older kids have come in. <laughs> They're like looking over my shoulder at the pictures because they remember the book. Um, so that was fun. The books that I'm most excited to revisit are some of my favorite classics, like Heidi and the Secret Garden, um, The Trumpet of the Swan by E.B. White. I'm going to do that one this next year with the kids. I cannot wait. I love that book so much. Um, and then there's been some fun new experiences. I never read Tolkien with my older kids. I just never did. Um, but the younger kids and I, read aloud The Hobbit twice this last year. Actually, we did, we listened to it on audio and it was so fun that I almost was like, oh oh man, I really missed out on this with the older kids, which is another kind of funny thing that happens when you're, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. So those are the things that come to mind. It's not just sometimes with my younger ones, I think, oh man, all the things that I didn't, I'm not doing with you that I did with the older kids. And I have to remind myself, I'm doing stuff with them. I didn't do with the older ones. It's just different. It's not better or worse. It's just different. (laughs) That's right. That's right. In the introduction, I mentioned the new publishing house that you guys are starting. I'm so excited about this. I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about Waxwing Books. Yeah, I would love to. I'm very excited. And we've been working working on this for a long time, but now we are finally ready to like launch the baby into the world. I'm very excited. So the publishing house is, um, it's basically a, a, a new independent imprint, a boutique imprint that we're really focusing on making books that um, kids will love to read, but that parents will also love to read aloud. Uh, because we all know that we, when we're reading aloud with our kids, they often want the same book over and over and over again. And those books that we read again and again and again, they can have a really high literary quality and really high artistic value um, to make them enjoyable for the parents and also just really rich. And we can all probably think of a picture book we really enjoy reading with our kids. And then also another one that makes us feel like we're going to poke out our eyeballs. (laughs) So how do we make more like this, the first and and less like the the latter? Um, So at Read Aloud Revival, that's what we're doing. So that's why we're starting Waxwing Books. And we are releasing our first picture book, we're opening it up to pre-orders this summer, August 10th. Um, we're actually going to release it on Kickstarter for pre-orders because we have, no, this is brand new for us and we have no idea how many books to print. <laughs> so we have been working on, um, it's been very exciting. We've hired pros from the New York publishing um, industry to help us with art direction and book design and editing and copy editing. And it's been such a huge learning curve for me. I feel like every time I turn around, I'm like, here's another thing. I have no idea what to do, but we're going to figure it out. Um, And we've made this really gorgeous book, but we just have no idea how many to print. This is a completely new, new territory. So we decided to launch it on Kickstarter, which actually is really fun because if you've ever backed a project on Kickstarter, you'll know that they the way Kickstarter works is you get to pre-order the book and then you get to pick some fun rewards. So we've made like custom seed packets that have art from the book illustrated by Breezy Brookshire. And she was homeschooled, so that's fun. She was, yep. And her illustrations are just stunning. Um, so we have like seed packets with those. We have a book, like a book bag we're only releasing with the Kickstarter and prints and postcards and really fun things. So that's kind of fun because we got to make a lot of extra pretty things. And it's really fun to make extra pretty things when you have Breezy's art to play with. So yeah, the the little preview sneak peeks I've seen of her art, absolutely gorgeous, really beautiful. So I'm definitely going to have the link to the Kickstarter and more information about Waxwing Books in the show notes. So wherever you're listening or if you're watching, be sure to click through and get your own special seed packets and book bags and fun pre-order stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, thank you. Sarah, here at the end, I'm going to ask you the questions. I love to ask all my guests. And the first one is just, what are you personally reading lately? Oh, fun. I love this question. Um, I am rereading one of my new favorite historical fiction novels called The Last Bookshop in London. Have you read this, Amy? I have not, but Heather Tully, a previous guest, recommended it to me. I got it from the library, but then I didn't get to it. And then my library sent me nasty emails telling me I needed to return it. So, (laughs) well, speaking of that, funnily enough, um, I just last night 
had a dream that I owed a hundred dollars in library fines from the last bookshop in London. And I was standing there looking at the librarian, like, how can I possibly owe a hundred dollars for a $15 book? Like, I don't understand how this works. Uh, I had this whole argument with the librarian in my dream. So we can unpack that. Such a homeschool mom nightmare. <laughs> It really is. Like, you wake up like panting, sweating. <laughs> the library finds. That's really funny. Um, it's a historical fiction novel. It's an adult novel, but teens could enjoy it. There's nothing inappropriate in it. Um, my team, my, let's see, I guess, no, my second daughter hasn't read it yet. It's on her list, but it's spectacular. And it's got like all the World War II things you like expect in a World War II novel, like the London Blitz, and they use words like ducky and stuff to to speak to each other and there's reading aloud that happens in the bomb shelters I mean it's kind of just amazing so um when I was reading it I was like how can this book be real like how can this exist in the world it was made for me so that I'm rereading that one we're about to um be reading well we're reading it for um our fam we always do a mama book club at read a lot revival premium for our moms so we always read a book together each season and that's what we're reading this summer and then we get to interview the author Madeline uh, Martin so that's why I'm rereading it. And then the kids and I are finishing up a book that we started in the spring that's taking us a million years to read aloud, which is Johnny Tremaine. It's very good. It's just taking us a million years. Also, it's summer and our normal read aloud rhythms go kind of cattywampus in the summer. So we don't get to it as regularly. And it's just take, I like things to kind of move along at a clip and I'm feeling like, whew, this book's really starting to drag. we got to finish this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and that one in particular, I feel like is a denser book to read aloud. So I've actually just sort of given that one to audiobook. I'm like, we'll listen yes. to that as an audiobook, or you can read it on your own. Yes. And um, Carry On, Mr. Bowditch is like the best read aloud because every chapter is short. So a little bit past the Revolutionary War time period, but every chapter is short. And so it's great for reading aloud. I'm like, this is what every read aloud book should have. <laughs> Do you, know you know I've never read, read I don't think I've ever read even myself carry on Mr. Bowditch. So, okay. You have so much to look forward to. It's historical fiction based on a true story of Nathaniel Bowditch. He was an American navigator. Oh, you have to read it. You will love it. Okay. Okay. Great. I cannot wait. Okay. Yeah. We're moving forward. We're um, reading through historical fiction through chronologically through American history. So it, we're reading. This is your next you title. What we this just is did. your next yes. title. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I cannot wait. <laughs> The final question I have for you would be, what is your best tip for helping the homeschool day run smoothly? Oh, um, it, can I give two answers? Two of tips? Course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. One is if you have any humans in your house for and under plan to do less. There is so much rich learning and loving and relationship building and life skills happening when there are toddlers and preschoolers underfoot. Your kids are learning how to lay their life down for each other. They're learning things you can't quantify and you won't even know for 10, 15 years. Um, and so I know it feels like when you have a bunch of preschoolers and toddlers that you're not getting to anything meaningful, but you just can't see it because you're in it. And I, I couldn't either. And so plan to do less and let God do more because he will. The relationship stuff that's happening that you can't put on a transcript or put on a lesson plan sheet to check off at the end of the day are really rich. That's the stuff that really matters. Um, and then the other thing I would say that's super practical that I do... Um, every time I look at like a new homeschool plan or like, you know, we're going to start a new school year. So I'm like, okay, what is our school day going to look like? Is I start by plugging in my read aloud. When am I going to read aloud? And when are my kids going to have time to read alone? So we do a quiet reading time. Um, my pre-readers, well, I don't have any pre-readers anymore, but when I had pre-readers, they would listen to audiobooks during this time. Um, but it's like either half an hour to an hour, depending on their age of um, time where the only thing they can do is read in their rooms, on their beds. They can read whatever they want from our collection, but they have to read. That's the only thing that's, or they could sleep, I guess, but no kid wants to sleep anyway in the middle of the day, <laughs> alas. <laughs> and so that's a time that at the beginning when I started doing quiet reading hours, we call it quiet reading hour, even if it's not an hour, um, they kind of resisted a little bit. And now it's like their favorite time of day because they know it's the time they can read whatever it is that they want to. So it's not school books. I mean, they could if they wanted, but again, they get to choose. So I plug those two things in first because I know that a lot of days go off the rails. And if I know that they've had time to read and I've read aloud with them, throw in some math there and I can be like, that was a win, even if we got to nothing else. So 
Oh, that is a really great tip. I like that because I think sometimes we forget to plan for that reading aloud or the reading alone time. And if you don't plan for it, it's just too easy for it to get forgotten or neglected. So true. Yeah. Yep. Sarah, yeah. where can people find you and Waxwing Books all around the internet? Okay. So the best place to find me is Read Aloud Revival. That's at readaloudrevival.com. You'll find everything there. We have awesome book lists um, based on different um, months of the year, holidays, different. We have like picture book biographies, suggestions for different time periods, all kinds of really good book lists there at readaloudrevival.com. That's also where you can find our podcast and all of our free re resources. Um, and then the Waxing Books, our first book, the pre-orders open August 10th, 2022. And the best place to find out more about that is at either waxwingbooks.com, or you can go find out about the book directly by going to a little more beautiful.com. Okay, great. And I will have links to all those things in the show notes for this episode over at humilityanddoxology.com. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been an absolute treat to get to chat with you. I have just loved chatting with you. Thanks so much, Amy. <laughs>